Good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Nissim. I'm the director of SPH Client and Mental Health Services. We are going to begin. During a person's life cycle, there are many meaningful and significant days that leave a beautiful mark forever. Births, marriages, homes, big accomplishments, joyful occasions. Sadly, on the flip side, days of tragedies and devastation leave an everlasting deep black hole in our hearts and in our souls and changes the way we think forever. The world experienced 9-11 and that day will remain for us forever. And that moment when we all heard that news will always be with us. The Jewish nation has added another date, 10-7, which will always be sadly with us. It has left us with feelings of being lost, helpless, scared, unsafe. Traumatic videos in our minds and images, our confidence in Israel's strength is in doubt. Our children have questions that we don't have answers for. We have questions, how, why? And how do we go about our lives while our brothers and sisters are suffering? What now? On a personal level, I had the pleasure this last weekend of joining SBH's junior marathon with ninth and 10th grade uh, greatest students. We walked in with great concern. Is this the right weekend? The heaviness, the intensity, what will be? We began our Friday night meal and a small group of students began to sing. And slowly but surely this group just became bigger and bigger and bigger until the entire room was filled. We were locked in arms singing from the deepest of our hearts, the songs that we needed to, that give us the courage as people. And the students reminded me on a personal level that we are an eternal people with a long road. At the same time, we may have questions, but what's important is we have to believe in ourselves and believe as a nation together. And that truly, we are never going to be alone and we are going to grow and become bigger from this. As a community, we should be so proud of ourselves. It took the US with all their budget and all their resources days to figure out how they can bring back people from Israel. Our community did it in hours. There were planes, there was resources, and there was help for everyone. I'm told 36 different campaigns are running over our yeshivas, over, over our shuls, over our organizations in the help and need. Restaurants have been taken over by our community to feed our IDF soldiers on the front line. Collections are going on across the board. Our yeshivot are collaborating with Israel and the returning students have a place to be. We should be so proud and the list goes on. As SBH, we are working round the clock, making sure and providing in, uh, identified uh, vulnerable groups that need that support so badly. We are offering parents with children in Israel support, young adult students returning back here support, families with members in the IDF support, and of course an ongoing crisis counseling drop-in that everyone is welcome to. In great sorrow, we have a topic tonight on how to cope with negative feelings on Israel at every stage. I turn to this magnificent, wonderful panel that are going to be here tonight, that are gonna give us school uh, skills and education and, and hope. I turn to our moderator, Dr. David Sitt, who is a licensed psychologist in New York a City with extensive experience as a therapist, an educator. He's also an SBH board member and a chair of the SBH Counseling Center. 
Dr. Sir is the founder and president of the Mindful Consulting Group and the author of the book ADHD Refo Refocused. Thank you so much, Simon. So uh, it took a lot for us to organize and scramble as quickly as everyone around uh, here in New York, across the country, and obviously in Israel, to get together what resources were necessary for we, what we felt were the immediate needs of our local community. And for this event, we were able to bring together four of the top uh, minds in the mental health space. And we're going to give a chance of each one of these panelists to share some thoughts from their areas of expertise and from the general field. And we're going to go through maybe five to 10 minutes with each um, panelist. And then hopefully we'll have some time to cycle back through and, and go through some other questions. I'd like to open up and invite uh, Dr. Norman uh, Blumenthal, who is the director of trauma bereavement and crisis intervention at OHEL, to start us off in this conversation. And one of the questions that we brought up with Dr. Blumenthal in preparation for this event was the, the overall understanding of what, what is trauma? And even beyond that, how do we understand what secondary trauma is? Us sitting here in distance and experiencing what's happening and, and the emotional impacts that it's having on us. And we thought that would be a really poignant way to open up the, the conversation. So Dr. Blumenthal, thank you so much for being with us. Okay, thank you very much. And one type of trauma is to try to get on a panel and one of the technical difficulties and you're not near a grandchild who can help you. So I apologize for, for the difficulties. I happen to be in Scarsdale. I just presented at the Young Israel Scarsdale Rabbi Morgenstone. He's sort of in the background struggling with me to try to get me on the computer. Uh, was, was kind enough to give me his office and his computer so I could, I could do that. And that was part of the delay. And I apologize. I also want to personally thank uh, Susan Shmuel and uh, the entire SBH staff, I have a very long standing and extremely mutually rewarding relationship with Sephardic Bikah Holim, which to me is a model of a community mental health center and a community center in general. And uh, it's really great to have that kind of connection and affiliation. So I was asked to define trauma and then talk about two, the type, what's the difference between primary trauma and secondary trauma. And I'm going to tell you that had I given this talk I'm going to say last week, it would have been very different. I have my understanding of what kind of trauma we're going through now has metamorphosed, has changed. So let me start by telling you first what trauma is, what secondary trauma, primary trauma versus secondary trauma, and then maybe just a word about how, what we can do on, in terms from that perspective of primary trauma, secondary trauma. So uh, about two years ago at the Oil Gala, the, uh, David Mendel, our CEO, decided that it would be a good idea if he would publicly interview me. And this way familiarize the 2,000 people that were there, including politicians, and of course, no less important benefactors about the work of our trauma team. So as part of the program, suddenly I'm up there on the stage with him and he's asking me some prepared questions for which I had prepared answers and we're just going through very smoothly. And then like any good moderator, and I'm sure you're gonna do the same, David, at the very end, he threw me the curveball. And he said to me, you know, Dr. Blumfeld, there's a lot of people out there that have had frightening experiences and have experienced fear. How do we know what's the difference between fear and trauma? So after stuttering and taking several shots of water and trying to put my thoughts together, I think came up with a pretty good answer. I said to them, if something happens to you and you want to forget it, you'd like it not to, like not to have known that it really happened, but your brain won't let get rid of it. Your brain won't let you get forget it. That's trauma. And trauma is really one of those kind of monumental cataclysmic events as we're going through that are so huge that we can't leave it. We can't let go of it. And there's a very good reason for the, why uh, God made us in that way, or if we want to be more secular, how, how we evolved that way, because <clears throat> these are life-altering events. And therefore, after they happen, we need to revisit them. We need to go back to them so we can integrate it. We can almost like sew them into our, our framework and our understanding of life. So uh, if you had a, again, 
some, God forbid, some sort of huge uh, tragedy or not huge even, you know, vehicular accident, you had a financial setback, something of that's an assault and it's over. Not, you know, it happened once and it's over, but it's big enough that you are going to understand the world differently. You're going to understand yourself differently. Your brain keeps taking you back and it's a message. You've got to deal with it. You've got to address it. I sometimes point out, interestingly enough, that sometimes even when I have very positive experiences, um, for example, my, my children's weddings, um, I will have flashbacks to my children's weddings. Now, those were happy occasions. I mean, paying the caterer was a trauma. I'll admit that. But short of that, uh, this was a very exciting, but it was four hours. My whole world changed. So therefore, my brain keeps taking me back. That's in essence what trauma is. <clears throat> now, when we, excuse me, uh, we make many differentiations within different types of trauma. One of the differentiations, differentiations we make is between primary trauma and secondary trauma. The primary trauma is the person who was traumatized. Um, so, for example, on the, 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 the people at the concert, the people in Kibbutz Berry, they experience primary trauma as these marauders uh, committed all these unthinkable atrocities to them. Technically speaking, when we hear about it, read about it, see pictures of it from the internet, that is technically secondary trauma. Now, secondary trauma and primary trauma in some respects overlap. You know, from secondary trauma, you can get flashbacks, you can have trigger responses. But the major difference between, let's say, secondary trauma and primary trauma is the primary trauma is that one huge event that shakes you to the core. Secondary trauma is usually a whole bunch of them that kind of build up. I mean, a classic call I'll get is sometimes from some of these heroic Hatzalah people in Yabek and B Israel, we need them. But they'll call me up and they say, you know, I've done everything. Ah, bullet wounds, severed limbs, everything. Today I got a call, a girl cut herself, she's bleeding, and I can't get her cries out of my head. That's because it's the 26th intervention and that catches up with them. So. Secondary trauma tends to blindside you. So again, last week, I would have told you that this is secondary trauma. We were not there. And we read about it, we saw about, we saw it, and we are experiencing secondary trauma. This week, I don't think so. I really think, and this, even if technically it's secondary trauma, the reaction that I'm having, that my family is having, and that everybody I've spoken to, and hundreds of people, this I think is my... 10th presentation since last week, um, everybody I've spoke to is experiencing primary trauma. We, this has, this was so huge and it's so relevant to who we are as a minority and Jews in this country or anywhere in the world. I think we are experiencing it as a primary trauma. And this, and I, I, so that's how I'm starting to think about it, even though, as I said, the reality of it is that it's secondary, but it feels very immediate to all of us. So I think this is primary trauma. Another differentiation we make within trauma, and, and David, please tell me when when I have when I'm talking. I have to a question brewing. I have okay, a question because, brewing uh, I'll, I'll go. That. I'll go till tomorrow. But uh, you know, my Ritalin's worn off. I'm in the no control. But um, I can send you some of mine. It's okay. I, okay. I'm... But but the other differentiation is we differentiate between an isolated traumatic event and an ongoing trauma. Um, an isolated traumatic event is, again, that one, the, the residential fire, the assault, the, 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 the sickness that suddenly hit, that didn't come on gradually, but uh, collapsing or something like that. Ongoing trauma is something you live with for a very long time. One could make an argument that COVID was an ongoing trauma. Um, you know, uh, living in an abusive home, in an abusive marriage is an ongoing trauma. Incarceration is an ongoing trauma. And they're very different from the singular event, you shriek, you scream, and the, the healing is to reclaim your sense of safety. You want to go back to that, well, you certainly incorporate the event into your understanding of life, but you try to reclaim, if you had a vehicular accident, you want to get back in a car. The ongoing trauma has the opposite effect. You shut down. You, you crawl into your shell. And if you, and I'm sure my colleagues have experiences, you work with someone who's lived regularly with trauma, it, it, just, it just completely shuts you down. In fact, even anatomically, 
They, they have studied people who have lived for years with certain types of abuse or mistreatment, and the cortical membrane on certain parts of the brain is thicker and the brain shrinks. You literally shut down even anatomically. And again, I would say this is a sudden trauma that was a one event, but given the enormity of it and given how it's changing us and given how it's lingering and going on, I think it's, it's morphing into an ongoing trauma. And I would leave you with the concluding message that we have to work very hard not to let that shutdown happen. I was presenting yes, uh, two day, yesterday to Chabad Shluchim, and it was going very well, and they're asking questions, and I felt very comfortable answering them. But again, it's that last question that is the bombshell. And the moderator asked me at the very end, Dr. Bonfield, you're telling us what to do. What shouldn't we do? And again, took a few drinks of water, tried to see if my wife was around to give me the right answer, but <laughs> I was on my own. And I, found, and I said to him, don't despair. Don't give up. We have a very long history of persecution. And I would even, I'll I'll just harness some uh, research I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but the research out of Emory University on ancestry and how familiarity with ancestry empowers you, gives you coping skills. And they studied three narratives of three family narratives. One narrative is considered, is called the descending narrative. Everything was great in the old country and it got worse and worse when we came here. The other narrative is the ascending narrative, which is it was terrible in the old country, we came here and everything was great. And the third is called the oscillating narrative. It was bad, it got good. It was bad, it got good. And I think by now you've guessed the most effective narrative for empowerment is the oscillating narrative. And we have to, we have to uh, mobilize that oscillating narrative to know, yes, it's been a very difficult time, unbearably difficult. And yes, as was as was mentioned by, by, by Simon, we have risen to the occasion. It's simply remarkable what we're doing. But we will emerge from this. I, we shudder at the thought of the cost, but we will emerge from that. And we can't have that, let that shut down and that what's called in Hebrew yeyush, that hopelessness, uh, overcome us as it would with ongoing trauma, because this, this does look like it's lingering for even even if Israel's God willing victorious and rids the world of Hamas, the effects of why that happened will linger for a while. I hope that's helpful, and I look forward to participating in the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Blumenthal. Uh, your insight, uh, as always, uh, when it comes to the most difficult of um, experiences and being a specialist in the trauma area, you know we've worked together and we've had you at the Kohalim giving us guidance, and today in particular sharing your thoughts on firstly. The difference between trauma and, and fear and understanding that trauma is an experience whereby it's something you, it, it occurs to you and you wish you could forget it, but you just can't. It just doesn't leave your brain, doesn't the imprint, the voices, the sounds, the images can't leave your brain. And today, in particular, in the nature that we're digesting the information and the imagery and voices, which I know we'll, we'll learn more about from Dr. Bubrick in a, in a moment, but that's triggering this trauma reaction. And then you further elaborated on the difference between primary trauma and secondary trauma, how this, even in your, in your own expertise, you're beginning to shift what you normally would have said this to be a secondary trauma. We're not there, wasn't direct, it was indirect, similar to September 11th. When September 11th happened, the research only talked about um, primary trauma, you being present, and that's what defined the PTSD was being there. And then we learned and understood how secondary experiences uh, emerged, and it was you know seemingly a new concept then. And but here you're going even further and saying, well, there is a way that things can shift, and 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 you're qualitatively experiencing this through all the talks you've been giving. And I think many of us here would agree that we've been speaking to our clientele or our friends and seeing the intensity of the trauma, and so much that you would even call it a primary experience. And further, you went on to explain how um, it's important for us to realize that this could be an ongoing experience. It may have launched into an, what might have been called an isolated experience, but it is now extending and expanding in an ongoing way, which could lead us to shut down, or it could lead us or anyone going through this to go into a shell. And your words of encouragement were to don't give up hope. 
don't despair. The question you got from the Chabad Shluchim of what not to do was not to shut down and don't despair. Don't fall into hopelessness and rise up, which we're already seeing Am Yisrael Chai and how many people are, are doing so. And so those words were incredible. If we have time, I do have other questions, um, but I want to make sure we have time to get everyone kind of initial um, thoughts out and then we can come back around and, and perhaps even all of us get into a dialogue. Okay, but thank you, Dr. Blumenthal. I'd like to turn to our second uh, esteemed panelist who's with us, Dr. Jerry Bubrick, who is the director of the Child Mind Institute. Many of you uh, likely have heard of the Child Mind Institute. It is really one of the venerable um, uh, uh, resources of guidance in the, in the child, adolescent, and even adult space. I know I myself came out of their training uh, postdoc program. Um, and we've had many uh, other clinicians from the Child Mind Institute with us. And Dr. Bubrick, we were hoping that you can shed some light on what is arguably, I think, the most one of the most common experiences that people are going through over the past week was how the role of media, social media, uh, 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 traditional media, uh, sharing links in, in, in groups on WhatsApp and, and other forms, how this is shaping not only the, the narrative, whether it be true or false elements, being able to, to discern, but even more so the effects that that has on our emotional state. And, and how might this be novel and something kind of unlike what we've seen before? We'd love to hear some of your insights. Hi, well, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be with you tonight. Um, it, it similar to how Dr. Blumenthal started. I would start a similar way. If I had asked me, if you had asked me to give this talk last week, it probably would be similar in some ways, but different in many ways. Um, I have the benefit of being with one of my daughters this morning. I have eighteen-year-old identical twins, and I was driving her to to school this morning, uh, taking a college class. And I said, "So, you know, what, what do you think about everything that's going on? How is social media affecting you on uh, with everything that's going on in the news?" And she kind of, and I, I, I practiced what I preach, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is that I had a captive audience. She wasn't able to escape the conversation, but it was also a side-by-side -side conversation. She was sitting next to me. Um, so it wasn't a face-to-face, eye-to-eye conversation, which can be so much more difficult for kids to talk about these difficult topics. And she she actually turned to me. I know it was a moment I won't forget for a long time. And she turned to me and she said, you know, Dad, honestly, it's confusing and really scary. Right. What a what a powerful thing for an 18 year old girl to say in this time. Um, and Dr. Blumenthal, I was thinking as, as you were speaking, um, I think many of us, including myself, to some degree, have experienced primary trauma from everything that's going on. And we have largely social media to thank for that, uh, because this is one of the first times in our history where we are seeing, and, and not necessarily because we want to be seeing, but because in many times we're kind of not so forced is a tough word, but because it's it's presented to us. Um, it, one of the first times in history where we're seeing almost in real time war, right? And it's different than what we see in movies, and it's different than what we see in TV shows, and it's different because it's real. And these are real people, and these are real events, and these are real Marauders was an interesting word. I like that word. These are real people hurting real people with no filter, with no warning, with no, you know, even when you watch the news now, they'll say, you know, they'll give you a moment. They'll say, you know, and they'll give you a little visual. Uh, pictures you'll see of me are explicit, take a moment or leave the room if you don't want to watch. You know, they give you that warning. But when this was happening on social media, there was no warning. It was just, these are the visuals, these are the visuals, these are the visuals. Look what's happening, look what's happening, look what's happening. And I, as a, as a child psychologist, as I do for a living, I was traumatized by that. How couldn't you be? Um, so I think we're, we're really, it's really changing the scope in which I think we see. Um, I mean, we certainly knew that the, the ill effects of social media and our kids before, and I could have told you before that, you know, one in three, about one in about 33 percent uh, of of, of uh, teenagers by the time they're eighteen will have developed an anxiety disorder, um, and we see the impact of social media having a profound acceleration of that, and we see a lot of people who are glued to their social media platforms last week, 
um, reporting that they're feeling more scared and more unsafe. So many miles away, but we're, we here are feeling unsafe because of the exposure to these images that we're seeing that we're really not supposed to be seeing and certainly not for a child's eyes to be seeing. I have a colleague who says that really, you know, it, it, the kids under the age of 10 shouldn't really be exposed to anything that what's going on in Israel with the violence. We should be explaining to them what's happening, but not really seeing any, any of the images or any of these stories. And we should really be shielding our children. So I think that's really where I want to come from is from a from a sense of parents understanding what's happening to our children as they're as they're uh, on social media, what they're seeing, what how they're how it's being portrayed. And then how do we respond? How do we provide? How are we going to be a source of comfort and knowledge and security and processing for our children while we're experiencing and in, in, in processing very similar things at the same time? Um, so I, I want to just go through a little bit, just in general, I don't know who the audience is and what your knowledge of social media is. I'm going to go at a very basic level first, and then we'll kind of, it will go from there. Um, but when you look at social media, you know, the, the, the one that captures the most of our children's eyes is YouTube. 94% of kids between the ages of 13 and 14 report using YouTube on a regular basis, Nine, over 95% of kids 15 to 17. TikTok, about 60% of 13, 14-year-olds and about 75% of 15 to 17-year-olds. Instagram starts going down 13 and 14-year-olds. Thankfully, 45%, about 75% of older kids or what are looking at Instagram. Snapchat, 51% of 13 and 14 and 15 to 17-year-olds, it's about 65%. And Facebook, the one that the old older people like ourselves might, the younger people in our late 20s might be thinking about uh, Facebook, 13 to 14 year olds are about 20% and 15 to 17 year olds about 40%. So there's all these different platforms in which to get information, but kids really flock to some where adults really flock to others. Um, but what we know about social media is that the more time you, and before all of this happened last week with Israel, the more time you would spend on social media, the more risk you have for developing anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, uh, poor body image issues. It, it has a profoundly negative impact the more time you spend on it. And we see as kids are now watching these very um, graphic, um, bloody, awful, horrific, violent uh, acts, we're see, I would can imagine we're going to see these numbers really growing exponentially. Um, so, um, so when you when you look at kids who are spending three plus hours a day on social media, they there was a study that showed they they show double the risk of developing depression or anxiety symptoms. Three plus hours. Now, if you ask yourselves, honestly, how many hours a week were you looking at per day on social media last week? I would imagine it's more than three hours. And if you ask your kids, it's probably way more than three hours. In some cases, I've talked to kids where I almost kind of felt like it was their obligation to look. It was the news. It was compelling. It was interesting. It was scary. It was, but it's, it's, it, but you know, what's interesting about social media is that kids, for the most part, are very skilled. Dr. Blumenthal, you know, you mentioned you needed a child, grandchild to help you figure out how to get on the screen. I, I chuckled to myself when I heard you say that. And for the most part, kids are very skilled at finding the information they want to find on social media. These images that were presented to them weren't by choice necessarily. They were images that they were found either by surprise or someone had, had sent them or linked them to them. So I think we're, 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 these kids are not only ex, ex, exposed to these images, but in a way where they're taken by surprise and then experiencing primary trauma as a result. So what happens to them is that um, the more time you spend on social media, the more likely you are to have so, uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety. A lot of the studies that look at these things won't necessarily, will kind of correlate depression and anxiety um, with the amount of time spent on social media, but they don't always look at um, um, 
if the if the depression and anxiety were there were present before the, uh, the the social media or after. So an interesting study, which is going to come back to what we talk about a little bit later, is that one study looked at if you remove social media from people's lives, they report feeling more happiness and more connection to the people around them, which is fascinating considering we're talking about something that's designed to try to help us feel more connected to each other. If we actually spend more time on that, we feel less connected. And then when we spend less time on it, we feel more connected to the people around us. So the trick is then how do we get kids to spend less time? But, let's, but the, the American Psychological Association last week um, issued a, a statement that said consuming violence and traumatic news in and of itself can be traumatic, can have a negative impact on our, on our, on our well-being. We know that fear and anxiety and traumatic stress have long-term effects on our health and well-being. Um, so, so when you have those images, like you had said, Dr. Blumenthal, you get those images stuck in your head, you can't unsee them. And when you have those images in your mind unstuck, stuck, and you can't see them and you're seeing them over and over and over and over, it has a profound effect on how we feel. It has a profound effect on how we process information. It has a, pro a, a profound effect on how we um, relate to others, on how we can make peace. How can we make sense of what's going on with all of these atrocities and all these the real-time visuals? It's too much. It's information overload for kids. It's too much information for them. It was too much information for me, and I'm. It's all. It was probably too much information for all of us. But what happens to these kids when they're exposed to these images over and over and these stories over and over is that the sympathetic nervous system kicks in and tells them that you're 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 in danger. This is wrong. You need to flee. You need to get out of the situation. You're in trouble. You're on, you're not safe. And that's where I think the problem really starts. It's going to start to explode with mental health. We were already on a path of have, seeing kids through the pandemic and through all of the, the changes in culture and society and all these things. We were already seeing increases in anxiety and depression coming. Now I think we're going to see them multiplying from here. So I wanted to have some of the talk be focused on what parents can do from here. How do we help our kids? How do we provide? How do we are? How do we be a, a source of comfort and information and processing to them? So I, I have a couple ideas. One is to go on what we call a social media diet. Limit how much time you're on social media, but it has to be top down. Because if you're telling your children, hey, it's not good, you need to have a few hours of non-screen time, but you're glued to your screen yourself, they're not going to follow what you're going to say, but they're going to follow what you do. Talk to your kids. Ask them, what are you hearing? What did you hear about Israel today? What are you, what are you worried about? What are things that don't make sense to you? Have conversations with them. But uh, from my point of, from my perspective on that side to side by side way, because in, in the face to face, you may not get a, you may get a different reaction than you would otherwise. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, you know what, that's a really great question. And I really want to give you the right answer. Let's think about it. Let's research it. Let's come back. And have opportunities to spend real time with your kids and have kids take real breaks from their social media. Practice doing healthy things for each other and for yourselves. The best way to build self-esteem is a question I get asked all the time. The best way to build self-esteem is to do things that you like and that you're good at. So instead of spending four, five, six hours on social media watching all these things, take an hour or two and do something for yourself that you enjoy. Go for a walk outside or especially in nature. Being in nature has a very calming effect on our, on our anxiety systems. Uh, things in general. Pick a time at night as a, as a family. A lot of these can be family rules. Pick a time at night where you won't check your phone. Have some sort of process where when you come into your home, all phones go into a basket or into a table and you can enter your home and do whatever you're going to do and not be connected to your phone. Uh, consider putting your phone on grayscale. 
You know, our phones are, they're, they're designed to get our attention. Red is an action color. So when you see a little red yellow or a red number next to your messages, you are going to be drawn to that red and you're going to want to make that red go away. So you're going to go to your, to your messages. So if you take away the red and everything is just black and white, you're not going to be as drawn or is it's not going to, it's not, you're not going to feel as compelled to go there for yourself. Um, turn off notifications. There's really no reason to be getting notification from social media, from all these different websites. Turn off, turn off notifications. Um, take a break from the apps to where you feel that you, you yourself don't feel good about the information you're getting, or you don't feel good about how you, how you feel about when you're on these certain apps or certain social media platforms, if you notice that you're not feeling good about the information you're getting, or you're not feeling good about after spending time with it, then turn it off, close it down, take it off your phone for a week and have parents be able to monitor and, and um, model this for their kids so that we're playing an active role in telling our kids, Hey, don't do this, but it's actually something we pre we practice ourselves. So I think it's it's really it's about this is a time where I'm I'm talking to my to my kids and my families about trying to be more socially connected to people who actually know your last name. Not just your people online, not your friends online, but your actual friends. Be more connected to the people who you're with. Try to spend a, a, a small dedicated amount of time on social media, but then free up time to actually be free for yourself and free and present for your family. So these 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 uh, kind of if I, if I could step in, uh, Dr. Bubrick, and give a couple of of kind of summary points um, of what you brought up for us today to really deeply think about. Some salient points were obviously th this is a scary and confusing time for uh, for our children and for us as well. This is one of those experiences where we are going through something while we're trying to figure out how to kind of observe and monitor and assist our children at the same time. It's one of those lifeboat scenarios, right? Of, of, of who, how do we put the vest on me and them at the same time? How do I, how do I just keep everybody afloat when we all feel like we might be drowning? And I know uh, one of our panelists, uh, Dr. Ayla Sit, is going to speak more about those, some of those dynamics with our children. Um, and you, you talked about how, you know, in particular that there's no warning to, much of what is consumed in in social media, right? You may get it on the on a television screen, but you may not get it on on a media feed. And you know, and and our the constituents that we're speaking to in in this particular Sephardic community, I would venture to say one of the biggest media sources is the WhatsApp chat world, which are comprised of people that many people that you do know their last names and you know them well, but yet even so, there's just a bombardment of media streams and links where you don't know what it's going to be. And there's almost an addiction. I can't miss that. And what, what if I don't press that link? What if I don't, how can I, how can I, maybe that video that they shared with me, that's going to be the one that's going to really blow my mind or really give me hope or really, you know, there's that dark part of us that, that is just too curious about the, the, the horrors. And we, we want to it, just, so it's a confusing experience. I think that people are having in particular in our WhatsApp chats, and you gave great advice about, let's say, muting an app, I would suggest that, you know, to take your advice, even for WhatsApp, people can archive. If there's a chat that's very heavily pounding you with, 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 with overwhelming information, you can archive that chat for a day, for an hour, for a week. The messages will be there if you need to go to it. But like you said, the shininess, the notifications pull us in. You gave great advice about grayscaling a phone. I've never heard that advice. And I love to talk about this topic of balance with technology. And that idea of going grayscale is very powerful. So people should be encouraged to look into that on your phones, how to turn your phone from being color, being grayscale. And you talked about great ideas of um, how to model for our children. So take that space from our from our phone, right? We can't be holding the phone and telling our kids, you know, turn off your phones, get off, you know, whatever it is you're on while we're on there. And that's very hard for us because we feel we're the adults. We can't, we can't, we can't miss out. We have to be on top of things. 
to protect them. But that's a fallacy in some ways, in this way, at least, that we need to model, as you're saying, take, you said family phone, you know, free time, family, free, you know, phone free time with the family, drop it in a box, put it in a drawer, have breakfast, lunch, dinner without the phones. We have the Sabbath, which is built in for many of us. Um, but go beyond that, as you said, because there's overload. And as you said earlier, there's the research that shows that, ironically, the more media we consume, the less connected we might feel. And the less media that we're engaged in, the more connected we can feel with the real life that's happening around us. And it's going to be hard for us to take that advice in this particular time when we feel so much is on the line. But nonetheless, I think it is, it's of utmost important to take your advice in many of these suggestions. Was there anything that we mentioned, uh, Dr. Bubrick, that they had any minor clarification on? No, that was a great summary. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your initial um, uh, wave of thoughts. And like I said, we're going to go through, we have two more panelists to share some ideas and hopefully we'll come back around. We're getting a flurry of questions, really powerful questions, and I hope we'll have time to get to some of them together as a panel. Um, next, I'd like to invite, let me remove him. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Shlomo Lieberman, who is a uh, the, who is a, a powerhouse in Sephardic Bikor Cholim. He's been with Bikor Cholim many years back and rejoined us and to bring the mental health division to great heights along with his team. Um, he is the director of the mental health uh, division at SBH. And we've asked Shlomo if he could speak to some of the coping mechanisms that might help us move forward individually as well as as a family unit. And I know some things have already been touched upon and I, I look forward to hearing Shlomo some of your particular insights. And from there, we'll hear from Dr. Ayla Sitt about focusing on children and how to help our children cope as well. So uh, Shlomo, please, your thoughts. Thank you, David. It's an honor to be here. I wish we didn't have to be here, but if we do, I'm glad we can gather and do this together. Um, it is clear from our first two panelists that it's understandable why everybody is getting stuck watching the negative horrors on the news and the social media. I've had my own clients tell me that uh, they feel obligated to watch. Um, Dr. Bruberg, you mentioned that, right? You know, there's an obligation. Somebody was telling me that if they don't watch, they feel like they're turning their back and they're abandoning the suffering of our brothers in Israel. Um, and um, I think the first coping mechanism that I'd like you to give you is a change of perspective. Um, another way of looking at everything that's really going on and all of the media um, and all of, uh, all of it that's coming down on us. Um, I myself have two daughters living in Israel. Um, my daughter, Leah, lives in the old city, and I was speaking to her last week, and she shared something with me that I thought was very deep, um, and I'd like to share it with you. She told me that there are actually two wars going on simultaneously. Um, there's the physical battle that the IDF soldiers are fighting, but then there's the psychological war that's going on, right? There is a psychological battle. The Hamas terrorists would like us, the Jewish nation, in Israel and here in America and all across the world, to feel scared, horrified, powerless, and paralyzed. Um, my daughter continued, she said, here in Israel, we don't have time to focus on the social media. We're too busy filling in for the soldiers on the front, whether it be in their homes, taking care of their families and children, or in their workplaces, taking care of their responsibilities while they fight, um, or even in the various different institutions they belong to, they need to step up and help out. And, and they really have no time to spend so much time focused on their phones and all the media and all the videos. Um, she said, it almost makes us immune to the psychological war um, and, and definitely to the powerless feeling because there's so much for them to be doing. Her fear was that here in America, Everyone is in so gross, so engrossed with, me, uh, with the media, the psychological war um, here in America for the Jewish people may be being lost. I believe that Leah is right. If, you, if there's only one thing you walk away with tonight, I want you to walk away with this thought. The thought that not being engrossed, not drowning in the terror of what's happening, 
not watching all the bone chilling videos filmed by the terrorist is not abandoning your brothers in Israel. It's actually being a soldier and fighting the psychological war. Um, you know, by protecting yourself, by protecting your family, um, there is a very big difference between being informed and being exposed to experiential information. Um, you know, we learn about the Holocaust all the time, even 50, 70 years later. It doesn't mean we are watching people um, get hurt and, and, you know, and all those live things that we, that we watched on this media. So by protecting ourselves, we're not turning our back on our people. Um, it doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're abandoning them. It actually means that we're, we're, we are soldiers in the same war that they are. It does not mean that you lose the battle if you begin to feel scared or if you're afraid or that sadness creeps in. That's not a sign of weakness. Those are normal and healthy feelings in a time like this and would be lying to ourselves if we said those feelings didn't affect us. Uh, it's important for us to be emotionally honest and recognize those feelings when they come and how those feelings affect us. Do those feelings want us to stop doing everything? Do they want us to not get out of bed in the morning? Do they zap, up, do they zap us of our energy um, so we can't move forward? Um, we have to recognize and understand what those feelings want, and then we need to make the hard decision to push ourselves to move forward and do the healthy things, even though we feel those feelings. Ordinary routine is a great way to fight those overwhelming feelings you get from um, all that's going on. I don't know if you remember the movie, Oh God, um, it's many years ago. Um, there's a, you know, I, it create the, the main character meets God and is talking to God. And when he, be, when he realized that he's actually talking to God, he becomes paralyzed and starts having a, um, a, a panic attack. And God says to him, hands him a shaver and says, here, shave. I created the mundane and monotonous things in life to keep you grounded, right? And that's, that's true. That's very true. Um, all our normal routines, um, our normal emails, our normal reports that we have to write, our business meeting, our lunches with friends, even our golf dates, they keep us grounded. They keep us moving forward, going from one step to the next step. Um, and they help us um, get out from under when we're overwhelmed by emotion. Um, so fighting the psychological war also includes things like self-care, um, happy and healthy experiences. With mindsets like this, the idea that we're fighting the psycho psychological war, we can take care of ourselves doing things we normally do or even extra pampering in a time like this, um, whether it be the massage or watching a funny movie with our family um, or going out to the favorite restaurant. We're not selfish taking care of ourselves in a time like this, but rather we are actually taking care of ourselves um, and not allowing the terror, the oppression to come down on us and affect us so badly. Um, and the same thing with your kids. Um, you know, doing this as a family is a great way of connecting and a great way of taking care of ourselves and, and our families. Um, some people have shared with me that they're canceling or delaying family events. They're postponing their birthday parties, engagement parties, family get togethers, um, and other smachot. They are too affected by the emotions of what's going on in the world. Um, and they feel like it would be wrong, right? How can I celebrate my birthday when all of this is going on in the world? Um, and that's what Hamas wants. It wants us to stop. It wants us to paralyze. It wants us to stop creating and stop moving on. We have a beautiful custom in, in, in our smachot, right? In our weddings, at the peak of our wedding, at the peak of the happiness, uh, the chassan steps on a glass remembering Jerusalem, right? That's a way of balancing moving on life as well with where we are in the sadness and the, the fact that, you know, so yes, you can have a party and stop the party and pause the party and have everybody read to Hilim for, for a little while for the people in Israel, but we don't have to stop living. We can't crawl of ourselves up into a shell and, and, and wither away. Um, as much as we can, we should carry on with our lives. Um, you know, one of the best ways of fighting powerless is to get involved in some kind of chesed, whether it be chesed towards and directly involved with the war in Israel, 
Um, I'm seeing so many beautiful things being done, packages being sent, deliveries, airplanes, buses, um, all the stuff that's going on, or even more local in our own backyard. Um, all the studies have shown that people who are involved in doing things for others, um, it has a way of protecting us from trauma, fear, and anxiety. It makes us feel, um, you know, it makes us feel powerful. Um, chesed is also how we fight evil. The more evil poured into this world, the more we answer it as Jews with chesed. Chesed events, one-on-one -on -one events, things you can do as an individual or things you can do as a family, even better. Um, a much better co way to cope with all that's going on rather than watching more and more is getting involved, helping other people. There are help people in your backyard that need help. And I'm sure that if you reach out to SBH, we can come up with ways of you getting you involved. Um, I don't know if I, um, most of you know what oxytocin is. Oxytocin is a great bonding horm hormone and neurotransmitter. It is what we feel makes us feel connected to other people. It's what makes us feel bonded to other people. It fights anxiety and fear. And it's the reason we want to reach out to others and connect when we are going through stress. This may be the time when we need to hug our children more, when we need to talk to others with eye contact, which obviously means we have to put down the phones, um, which means that we have to listen to each other and be heard. Um, we may need to share our feelings more and hear others in order to fight some of the negative feelings within us. Um, I want to, ironically, I want to share a story I heard on a, one of these media clips um, coming out of Eretz Yisrael earlier in the week, earlier last week. There was a woman, an elderly woman, um, who was um, at her home when five um, Hamas terrorists broke in and were held, holding her captive in her own home. Um, she looked at one of the terrorists and said, you look pale, you must be hungry. And she fed them a meal. And five hours later, when the, um, the Israeli soldiers came in and took out the terrorists, um, they were all sitting around eating chocolate chip cookies. Um, and when she was asked, um, she responded two things that I think are fascinating. The first thing she said is that I just knew that hungry men are more dangerous than fed men. Good point. Good thought. The second thing that she said is, this is who I am. This is what I do. When people are in my home, I feed them. She did not allow the fact that she was in a terror situation to change who she was and to dictate her response. That's a powerful thing to be able to do. Um, and if it's, a, it's me, it's, it's a motivation, it's something to look up to, it's something to, to emulate in the idea that we don't want them to dictate how we feel or what we do or how we react. We want to decide the best version of ourselves and be who we need to be. Thank you. Uh, Shlomo, thank you very much for extremely powerful insights you brought us from a personal story with your daughter, Leah, in Israel, who shared with you the idea that has since framed how you've been seeing things over the past week, which was that the war that we're seeing, that we're hearing about and witnessing is bi bifurcated. There's two parts to this. There's the, the physical war and there's the psychological war. And the fact being that one of the arsenals, the, the top arsenals in the psychological warfare is our digestion and overconsumption and near addiction to media. Whereas in Israel, you pointed out how perhaps initially people may have been searching for um, clips and to see what's happening, as, as was pointed out by another panelist, um, that we are seeing war in real time as Dr. Bubrick said, for the first time. And so people are naturally drawn to that. But in Israel, they shifted fairly quickly to get out and 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 do and take action and be out on the streets. And that is a protective measure. Whereas here in the States or around the world, outside of Israel, we are not as protected. We are we're left with the media and perhaps we're convincing ourselves that this is the best way. In fact, I, I heard uh, someone who expressed that to me early on 
when I, I said to a friend, to a group of friends in the chat, uh, we should all consider reducing media intake. This is not healthy for us, even from COVID. We know this from COVID, overconsumption. It's not healthy. And, and one particular person voiced a comment and said, well, but I think this is how I'm arming myself. I think by getting more information, I, I feel like it's giving me power to, to do something with it. When the reality is that it's, it's not the case because um, as you said, it, it creates um, uh, uh, reduction in in control, we actually feel more helpless. It actually makes us feel more guilt-ridden that we can't do more. And so I think that was very, very important points. And then you provided us with a couple of really uh, valuable, actionable steps we can take. One was the idea of, of the ordinary routines that don't underestimate the power of, you know, going for a haircut, the power of uh, uh, you know, playing with your, you know, building a, a Lego set with your kids, the power of going for lunch with friends and talking about other things, the ordinary routines, as you said, you know, going for a shave. You talk about the importance of self-care and that can take many different fronts, whether it be exercise, whether it be make sure you're maintaining sleep. I can't tell you how many of my clients over the past week have told me I have not been sleeping. I am up glued to my phone till two, three, four, five in the morning. And the first thing I do when I roll over is open up my phone and sleep has just been decimated. And that's not healthy for our self-care. Making sure that we eat well, maintain our nutritional stance. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned exercise. The same things that we told people during COVID holds true now. In times of stress, self-care is important. The third thing you pointed out was chesed, the power of chesed. Not, you know, certainly it can be things related to helping Israel. And that's wonderful. There are many opportunities. I would encourage people, though, to vet. These days, there are a lot of chesed and, and, and fundraising and, and it's just proliferating. But we have to make sure we're doing it in, in with vetted organizations so that our effort can 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 connect with with our um, intention. But also it could be local chesed. It can be something like going to visit someone in, in locally. It could be a food pantry. It could be uh, doing an act for someone who who otherwise needs that the kindness. And you gave you know great shout out for SBH. Obviously, we're here as an organization to help people connect that intention to an action for bikochulim chesed opportunities because it protects us and it empowers us and it gives us the sense of agency. And those are crucial elements to. Be soldiers, as you said, in this war. Even if we aren't with fatigues on, we have to protect ourselves from being fatigued. And this is one way of doing so. And finally, you pointed out um, how there are chemicals in us, oxytocin, uh, which are helps fight anxiety and fear. And, and it brings up joy into the, into the body by doing kindness. It, it uh, promotes the production of the, these healthy chemicals in our in ourselves. Um, and you wrapped it up with a beautiful story that I had not heard of, of the grandmother who made chocolate chip cookies and otherwise fed people who were there to harm her. But that's what she did because that's what she does. And that's how she survives and was by being present as who she is and not retreating into a shell. So I think that was a really beautiful word, Shlom. And I really appreciate all that you're doing for us at SBH and for the community and Am Yisrael at large, along with everyone here on this panel. So thank you, Shlom. Our uh, our uh, next panelist, uh, Dr. A. Um is a is the senior staff psychologist at NYCBT, a uh, private practice uh, over in, in Manhattan, but that serves the, the New York and New Jersey area. Uh, Ayla is also the chair here at Sparta Bikocholim's Courage to Heal program, uh, as well as the co-chair of the mental health division at Bikocholim. And uh, Ayla, we were hoping you could speak to us about what the impacts are on our children. I say our children, Ayla and I happen to share four children. Um, and uh, even in our own home, just the other night, uh, one of our children uh, going to sleep, putting him to bed, he turned to me and he said, Dad, I'm scared. I don't want to go to sleep because I'm afraid of of if something bad will happen to us and how will, how do how do I know that someone's not going to come into our home and and how do I know that things are going to be safe with Israel and how maybe we can never go to Israel again and he had all these questions and fears and and I did my best to to be present with him and I'm sure I'm not alone 
in people with children of all ages. It could be the youngest of children, from two years old, all the way up to our adult children. And how can we help um, uh, our children kind of navigate these times? Ayla. Thanks, David. Um, before I start, I just want to share that this has been so helpful for me, even as a therapist going through, you know, this terrible time, I think we're all sort of grasping for straws in, in trying to figure out how we can, you know, what we can do to protect ourselves, protect our families, protect our mental health. Um, and it's an overwhelming task. And, you know, I saw all of us panelists who, you know, specialize in mental health, scribbling things down. And, and, you know, I think it speaks to how big this is and how painful this is for all of us. Um, so thank you for, for everybody sharing um, your thoughts. Um, and I'll do my best not to repeat some of the things that you've already said. So um, the first thing that I wanna share is that as parents, we have so much on us right now. Um, as we can see, we're all struggling. Um, we're all feeling an overwhelming amount of emotions, what feels like all the time. And then on top of that, we have our children's emotions that we're trying to keep an eye on and manage and be sure that we're saying exactly the right thing. And I know that we feel like there is that right thing and perfect way to say what we're trying to say. Um, and I hope that I take some burden off of you when I say that there isn't. Um, there isn't a perfect way to share a tragedy. Um, there isn't a perfect way to, um, that's gonna work across the board. And it, there's no one size fits all. So um, instead of spending time listing out, you know, preschool age, elementary school age, middle school and high school age and a different script for each, um, I'm gonna have SBH link uh, scripts to our page afterwards so that you can each look at it and then modify it to your own child because not all children are the same either. Um, and you obviously wanna make sure that what you say is appropriate for your child, keeping in mind that we want what we say to be both age appropriate and honest. So instead of thinking, instead of talking about what exactly how to say what, what we're gonna say, I thought it would be helpful for us to think about things we might wanna avoid doing with our children. So the first thing that I was thinking about is being mindful not to tell your children not to feel what they're feeling. So I think Shlomo touched upon this a bit in terms of what we're feeling. And it's also very normal for our children to be feeling similar emotions, fear, about what's happening and what that means, like David was sharing with our eight-year-old um, sadness about all of the loss that's happening and all the, the death, guilt. I know there's a tremendous amount of guilt that us as adults are feeling and also our children might be feeling that same way, especially if they were in Israel and then they came home, the guilt of I should be there, a lot of those should statements. And all of these emotions are normal and all of these emotions make sense. And so make sure that we're validating the emotions that our children are feeling rather than telling them that they shouldn't be worried or they shouldn't be sad. Um, you know, let them, let them have that and let us validate what they're experiencing. And then we could go from there. The second thing that I, I think would be helpful for us to be mindful about is listening more than we're talking. Um, I know Dr. Bubrick mentioned this a bit with his daughter, but asking them what they know, um, asking them how they're feeling without trying to interject and come up with exactly um, you know, the, the information and the facts that we want to share with them, let them share with us. Um, and then if they're sharing facts with us that aren't facts, that's when we can correct them, gently correct them, let them know that those are not facts, but let them share what, what they know so that we're not overwhelming them with information that they don't know. And we, we don't want to tell them based on their age and the appropriateness level. Um, so that would be the, the second point I would make is just let them talk and we do more of the listening. The third thing that I would say to be mindful of not doing is try not to shut down questions that are uncomfortable. Um, a lot of these questions are uncomfortable that we're getting. And what we want is for our children to feel comfortable 
asking uncomfortable questions and for us to be willing to have these uncomfortable conversations. If we don't allow for these conversations, it's very possible our children will turn to social media, will turn to the internet to get these answers that we're not giving them or turn to friends. And then we've lost control over the dialogue or perhaps they'll choose to internalize not asking questions as a better resource and both of those will be detrimental to our children. So allow for these conversations. You may not have all the answers um, and that's okay. Don't try to make them up if you don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know, but that's a great question. I'm gonna look into it or I'm gonna, when I find that out, I'm I'll be happy to, to, to share that with you. The fourth thing that I would say, and I know this one's really hard because I feel it all the time with my kids, is try to stay away from making promises that you can't keep. So be mindful of, saying, uh, of not saying things like, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about, because I think we can all understand that there are things to worry about, or everything will be all right. The last thing we want to do is lose our, our children's trust in us. If we say everything's going to be all right, and then they hear one more death, then they've lost their trust in, our, in, in us telling them the truth, right? And we definitely don't want that. So instead, there are other ways of sharing. Um, you can say, your safety is my number one priority. And we have partnered with different people and different groups to continue to keep you safe. So um, different ways of, of, of sharing the control that we do have without making promises we can't keep. The last thing I would say is if your children don't feel ready to talk about it, don't push them. Everybody has a different way of coping. And I know we might have the thought, oh, but they're not talking about it. That means that they're internalizing all of this and then they're just gonna explode or what does it mean about them? What kind of person uh, doesn't you know, wanna talk about a tragedy that might impact them? So be really mindful of the interpretations and the judgments and, these, you know, uh, path, like pathologizing your children and recognize that everybody deals with grief, everybody deals with trauma in different ways. What's more important is letting them know that you're there and you're open to having those conversations when and if they're ready. Um, and, and so uh, those were, were some of the things that I was thinking about of, of what we wanna to try to avoid. Um, Shlomo spoke to a few of the things I was thinking about of how to make our children feel, feel more helpful. Um, I'll just say them really quickly. One was the contributing that Shlomo said, you know, help them contribute in whatever way is age appropriate, whether it's drawing a picture that goes into a package to, to people in the army, whether it's praying, um, you know, contributing in, in, in whatever way takes our anxiety, takes our pain and puts it into action. And that gives us a sense of control. And a lot of us are feeling a lack of control and our children are also feeling that lack of control. Um, this one might be very hard for right now, might apply to some children, might not apply to all, is finding meaning in a tragedy. It's a very, um, it's a skill that can be really helpful when used if you're open to it. And one meaning or one message that I've heard come out of this that Simon mentioned as well is how we've united you know, Israel was really divided before this. And one thing that we've done is we've united in one mission to protect Israel and to protect Jews. And Chesed has increased exponentially. Kindness to one another in the, Jew, in the Jewish population, Israel has increased. And if we can get one positive out of it, maybe that's it. And maybe there's going to be more meaning we come from, you know, as time passes. And maybe this isn't, you're not ready for this. So, you know, maybe in a month from now, this will make more sense to you or maybe never, um, but just a thought to, to think about. Um, Shlomo men mentioned routine and structure, very important for children, gives them a sense of control and safety. And, you know, being present with them, um, you know, like Dr. Kubrick mentioned, putting down your phones, giving them extra hugs if that's what they need, letting them know you're there um, and keeping that dialogue open. So again, it's not just one conversation, then we could check off a box and say, we did it, keep it going. Um, you know, make sure they know that they can come to you whenever. So hearing these, these ideas, uh, Ayla, are, you know, again, I think 
you're giving us a lot to think about. Um, you highlighted several different areas for parents to consider. The first being to understand that there is no perfect uh, answer. There is no perfect approach. A, because all of our children are different, different ages, different temperaments, different scenarios are coming at them. And so we as parents need to kind of drop that expectation of, oh, I got to get it just right. It better be the perfect answer. We maybe perhaps need to zoom out and, and kind of take some of the other advice you're giving for example, um, be there to listen. And that is one of the most effective ways to be present for our children is to know that for them to know that we're there to hear them, even if it gets uncomfortable, even if the questions they have seem, you um, uh, know, we may have an initial reaction of don't, don't ask that. And your advice is it's okay. Let them, let them ask the uncomfortable and hold what, you know, as we, as we use the language in the biz, hold the space for them to be able to, kind of bring up that uncomfortable and and be mindful uh, to to uh, shy away from judging their uh you know be, being kind of tough about it or saying we should do this or we must do that or or even just to sweep things under the rug and say things like oh it's all going to be okay everything will be good and again it's natural for a parent want to want to reassure their children that it will that life will be okay that there will be nothing that will harm them and, and of course that's a natural urge of a parent but we have to be mindful of the realities that if we present them with information that's that's too Pollyannish or 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 um, uh, overprotective in a way that that misses the reality that there 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 may be challenges out there. But your point that you made, Ayla, was we are working together to address the challenges. We are Am Yisrael is is gathering strength together, and we are taking measures to be protective of you and um, you know etc. Those are. Uh, ways of communicating that can be more effective for our kids um, and also to be open they may not be ready to speak we heard the idea of sitting next to someone rather than across from them right if we come at somebody come on tell me what you're thinking tell me what's going on at school what did you talk about what did you nothing no nothing we need to be aware to, to let our kids know I'll, if you're not able or not ready to speak know that i'm always here you can come and talk to me at any time we can draw together we can color together for younger kids we can build together engage together do activities together to help kind of foster their relationship even more so in these times than maybe we might have been doing last week to step up our game to be present with our kids so that they know that the bond is strong that they know that they can trust us and that we will be there um to provide that that safety so thank you for those great points. Um, I would like to take a few minutes to um, speak to some questions that have come up from uh, from the audience. Uh, I want to give the first question to Dr. Blumenthal because I know he has to run soon. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you a, a question that I, I think you can answer in that in a short period of time. Um, an audience member reached out and sent the following question. I'm going to read the whole thing because there was a compliment in there as well. Hey, hello. Thank you for this wonderful webinar. Three exclamation points. Really, maybe there was five for all the attendees, all the speakers. The first speaker said, the trauma is an event that your brain won't let you forget. How do we help the brain let it go? I'm extremely upset about what's happening. It shook me to the core and I'm worried that I won't be able to let it go. So uh, first of all, thanks. I want to thank all my colleagues. Um, I really enjoyed everything I'm saying. It's very reassuring to know that such people with such insight and sensitivity are taking care of our community. It was also very nice to hear a husband really pay attention to his wife. So that was uh, <laughs> that was also very reassuring. <clears throat> um, I have to adopt that policy, I guess. Um, so th 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 what happens is we don't let it go. What, what we do with trauma is we, we internalize it. Uh, life events have a bearing, a, a change us and shape us. And the, the kind of events that are we associate with trauma as we're going through right now are really life-altering events. God willing, this will be done soon and hopefully with minimal cost as uh, in terms of loss of life and, and, and hurt. But hopefully Hamas will be removed from the face of the earth as it deserves to be. <clears throat> but even then, when the soldiers come home, we have more security. This is not going away. We're a new people. We're a new country. We're a new religion. And that's what, that's why, that's what trauma does. So we don't, 
get rid of it like we would get rid of, um, you know, if you have a strep throat, you take an antibiotic and you get rid of it. This we use and we interpret, we internalize it and it becomes part of who we are. And that's how, that's what I would anticipate would happen and, and hopefully better people and uh, more caring people, more united people and more appreciative of sacrifice in life. And who knows what else we can predict. Okay, thank you. So the idea here is that it, it's 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 not like um, the old classic whack-a-mole, right? Where you think the ob object is something terrifying comes up, I have to have to squash it because actually it's the old you know if you close your eyes and you tell someone you know picture a white polar bear, it's fur, it's white, it's black nose, the snow behind it. You know, picture that now. Get rid of that image. Get rid of it. It's very hard for the mind to do that, but rather no. we work no. with. We work with it and actually provided a space where it gets integrated into the larger space of our mind, which if you think back to our lives, every one of us, whether it be small, medium or large, has challenges and difficulties and stress, anxiety, and sometimes even trauma that if we address it in, in a way of, of, of bringing light onto it rather than trying to kind of scurry it into the darkness, it, our brains have a method and a way of integrating. And I will add, if it's too difficult for people and they're finding that they just cannot seem to get there, there are professional uh, resources to help you through that. We have at uh have resources at OHEL, there are resources, at Child Mind Institute, there are resources, at NYCBT, there are resources. All of us represent different organizations that professionally help people work through and manage uh, uh, trauma. And so if it hits that point, then please reach out to any one of the organizations. Of course, Bikorchalim is here, as well as we mentioned earlier, and I'll summarize later on in a few moments with the resources that we are currently have available. And I apologize, but I'm in borrowed space. Yeah. I'm in a shul and the attendant wants to lock up. So I, I really do need to leave. We'll bid you uh, adieu. Okay, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And let, let's hope let's hope we we can help our, uh, everybody soon. Help everybody, and that the help won't be needed soon. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Doctor Blumenthal. Thank you as always. Um, okay, I'm going to turn the next question. Um, uh, we'll kind of go back in order. Doctor Buberg, we had a question come in about media and so and and, and uh, limits. And one uh, um, parent wrote in that I am limiting what my child sees on social media. I am putting those filters in place and I'm speaking to them about, about that, those limits. However, I'm worried that I'm unable to protect them from what their friends are watching and what their friends on their devices might be showing them. What can I do to go a step beyond to help my child remain quote unquote protected? Well, I mean, I think it kind of goes back to what Ayla was saying before. Like we, we, we can't always protect our children. Sometimes we need to kind of let them experience what's out there and help them come to terms with what it is that they're experiencing or what the world is experiencing. Now, I talk to, to families and parents all the time about how, you know, and it, it was mentioned before, I think in the, in the, in the forum about how we, we sometimes see ourselves as fixers and protectors for our children. When the reality is we can't always fix and protect Sometimes we have to, you know, I'm an anxiety specialist. So I talk to parents all the time about how, you know, we can't um, um, shelter our kids from anxiety or, or give them the answers. Sometimes the answer, sometimes the best we can do is help them to not know, to help them tolerate the uncertainty, right? So it's okay if your friends and their parents want or are open to them seeing something and that's their business and that's their life and that's their household. We in our house, in our home, this is what we abide. This is what we are doing. This is what we think is healthy for each other and, and for, for ourselves. And so let's talk about it. How does it make you feel to know that your friend maybe has a different access to social media than you do? How does that affect you? Why is that good? Why is that bad? Instead of just, you know, um, um, telling them this is the way it is, let's actually have a conversation. Why do you think this is fair or unfair? How is it that person has more access? Are they Do they seem happier than you? Do they seem more unhappy to you? Like, what impact do you think it's having on them? 
Could you understand why we're having this perspective for our household? And can we allow others to have a different uh, opinion or, or process for the home, for their home? And neither can be right or wrong, but healthy for what we think is best for us. I think that's really, really wise advice um, to be able to kind of prepare our children and know we, we, we can't control it all, right? We can't really uh, you know, block out every influence. And the, the point here is almost about education, right? So even if there are younger children, you know, if a child's old enough to have a phone and have a device, you imagine they may be old enough, even if it's 10 or 11, because kids, you know, are young, they can still understand the idea of why we're putting these limits in place. What is the reason for this? And to explain to them, it might be that your friend might show you things. And here's how we might hope, we hope you'll understand where we are coming from. This is not a punishment. This is not something that you're doing wrong or bad, but we're trying to empower you to be able to have safety and control. And and and, and again, we, we can't guarantee. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Buber. Um, so another question came in. We'll, we'll probably cover maybe two more questions because I know people, uh, you know, the, the hour is late. Um, but a, a question came in. Uh, question came in that said, I'm a mother of four children and I'm trying to keep it together. But I just keep imagining terrorists coming into my home and doing this in my own house. And I, I don't still feel safe ch trying to hide it from my kids. I don't feel safe and I'm trying to hide it from my kids. How 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 can one cope with this? I don't know if, if either Ayla or Shlomo uh, feel like they want to field this one. All right, Ayla, unmute it first. Uh, I could start and Shlomo can add. Um, you know, I, as a mother of four kids and having had similar thoughts myself, I can definitely um, empathize with, um, with what, you know, with what she's describing. Um, I think a few things that are important to remember is that our brains are going to the catastrophe. Our brains are going to the worst case scenario. Um, and it's understandable that it's doing that given what we're, we've all just experienced and as we talked about trauma, like that is what trauma is, right? Like our brains imagine things, it, we replay things we've seen and imagine them happening again, right? Um, and so that all makes a lot of sense. And we wanna be mindful of the fact that that's our, our mind. That's our how our mind is sort of choosing to go to the worst case scenario, choosing to see that catastrophe. And one way that we can work is bringing ourselves back to the present. Um, and reminding ourselves what what's happening in this what this one moment, what is actually real for us right now, and right now there isn't a threat um, that we know of, right? Um, just like there's always the possibility of a burglar coming into our home. There's always the possibility we had something like this in Deal this past summer, right? Um, there was there was always a possibility of danger, and obviously maybe our risk is higher than it would have been before, and it's still very low. Um, so for right now, with the facts that we currently have, I would work on practicing bringing yourself back to the present, reminding yourself of what the facts are right now. Um, and David, I wanted to share that somebody sent this to me like an hour before, and I just thought it was super powerful. Um, it was a story of, of a woman who was in, um, in, in, the middle of the Hamas terrorist attack and was hiding under a bush. And she said that every time she felt fear for six hours, she was hiding in a bush. And she said, every time she felt fear, every time she felt anger, the only way she can gain control was to bring herself back to the present by thinking of three things she could cherish. And she said, thank you for this bush that guards and protects me. Thank you for the birds that sing to me. And thank you that I function so wonderfully in the situation I'm in right now, if it, it was a translation from Hebrew. Um, but you know, I think it speaks to the fact that even in the most painful situations, even in the most anxiety provoking situations, we can find things to be thankful for. We can find things to bring ourselves back to thank you for this house that protects me. Thank you for this alarm system that I have. Um, and remind ourselves of what's real and where our mind is taking us to the worst case scenario. 
well well addressed you know the idea of being our minds will produce this is a, a time of fear and a time of panic it, it's natural and i think it's more for also people to, to understand there is a normality we're here multiple trained clinicians and every one of us has said in our in our address tonight we too are overwhelmed we too are afraid we too are feeling the panic but we also are speaking to the resilience that is 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 also inherent and built in us as the story that Ayla just shared about the woman who was hiding out in the bushes and 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 thanked you know for being able to have that resilience um and to be able to ground ourselves in the present moment um is a powerful mechanism to help get through those those escalations of of anxiety um I have other another question, Shlomo, that I can bring to you, unless you had something else you wanted, and any other points you wanted to make? No, I couldn't say it better. I really did a perfect job. Okay, so I'll make this the last question because of just being aware of time. Um, we have many listeners uh, tonight, and by the way, our apologies. We had put into the uh, uh, we have a, a feature. We we sent out a message earlier in the talk that people were able to send uh, a question to an email address or through Instagram. Not everybody saw that. We apologize. Um, uh, we, we really ended up getting many questions anyway that we, we couldn't address. Some information will be posted on our um, Instagram feeds and our social media feeds through Bikor Halim. In a moment after the last question, we'll post some other information uh, in terms of resources. But the last uh, question uh, for Shlomo is regarding uh, parents and even some, some college-age students that are listening uh, who are concerned about how people can uh, address the the growing wave of um, of, of political protests, um, and not so much around the political side of things, but just in terms of feeling safe and what people might be able to do. And I'll, I'll caveat before you even speak. I think it was a good question to ask, but I'll, I'll let our audience know that tomorrow night, our our a, a sister organization or, or or a fellow organization in the community, the Sparta Community Alliance (SCA), is hosting a conversation geared towards uh, students and young adults who might be facing some of these questions. I I I, I believe I'm going to be on that. I should be on that panel tomorrow night, as far as I've, I'm told. Um, but I think it's worth our audience tonight to hear some insight. Shalom, if you have anything about the emotional kind of anxiety that people are feeling going to their their education centers where there's protests or whatnot so um i'm gonna go back and i'm gonna uh you know go back to that i too um you know i too have a problem after hearing all the horrible things that have happened um hearing people um cheer on hamas and and celebrate a successful attack against israel the way they are um i too have a hard time swallowing that as well as um, you know, how do we, you know, understand that these are our neighbors, right? You know, these are the people who live next to us, who go to college with us, um, who share the classroom with us, maybe. Um, that's a very hard thing to do. Um, and, you know, I, I it's, it's a, it, it, it is something that, you know, I can't tell people not to be upset and let it be water off, you know, their back because that's, that's not reality, right? The reality is, you know, somebody is literally, um, celebrating, um, you know, the catastrophe that happened to us as a people. I do think, though, that um, we have to remember that we have a long history. I think we have to remember where we've come from and what we have lived through and what we have gone through. And and these are just more talking heads. Um, you know, I, I don't think most of the people who are um, pro-Hamas in today's or understand who Hamas is or understand the history. I don't think that, um, you know, that that um, they have an understanding who we are as a people, as a Jewish people. Um, they don't understand what anti-Semitism is and the, and the history of anti-Semitism. Um, and I think that we have to do what we need to do in order to make sure that we are safe, um, you know, within our colleges, within our classrooms, within our homes, within our neighborhoods. Um, but at the same time, we don't need to put too much um, integrity or intelligence or um, into what they're saying, into who they are. Um, you know, it, 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 it just makes them more powerful. Ultimately, um, there are going to other, always be other voices out there, and we're going to have to 
um, drown them out um, in our lives and move on without, you know, being um, too distracted or affected by them as much as possible. Okay, Shalom, thank you. Uh, again, this is, you know, a, a question that I think it's more, uh, will be more appropriately addressed in tomorrow night's uh, SEA talk, look out for their announcements on social media. Um, I would like to just uh, take this moment to once again, thank our panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be with us tonight. Dr. Norman Blumenthal, who had to uh, uh, log off a few moments ago um, uh, from OHEL, uh, Dr. Jerry Bubrick from the Child Mind Institute, the director of the Child Mind Institute. Thank you so much, Dr. Bubrick, for being with us tonight and sharing your counsel and wisdom with us and our audience. Shlomo Lieberman from Sephardic Bikocholim, the director of the Mental Health Division. Thank you for bringing your deep insights. I'll tell you on the side, someone made a comment that that's, that was as deep, that was a deep, like a particular influential uh, rabbi in our community who gives great, powerful drashas. Uh, your talk really resonated with people and um, you know a lot of gratitude for the wisdom that you share. Uh, to Dr. Ayla Sitt uh, for giving us your insights into how to manage the, the impacts on our children. Um, these are all very difficult uh, topics. Uh, also, I'll mention uh, Simon Nisim, who had to uh, step out, uh, who's the director of our client and mental health services division at SPH for his opening remarks. All of all of uh, you were really wonderful in stepping up and bringing your clarity and wisdom and your practical tips to help uh, those in our community or those listening uh, figure out how to cope and manage through these difficult times. I will, I will close out by reminding our audience that he, here at Sephardic Bikocholim, we have many different avenues for you to get support. We have, uh, whether it be support groups for families with relatives in the IDF, whether you are, seek, you are a college student who has returned from Israel and is seeking some stability or seeking some groundedness and, and, and a sense of support, we have a group for you. Uh, whether you be a, a parent of a child who's, or, or a young adult who is still in Israel uh, and will be remaining in Israel potentially, we have a support group to help those as well, as well as um, ongoing drop-in counseling sessions, all available through the links that are posted uh, here on the slide. And then we'll be, we'll be having follow-up um, messages through social media. We will share other information from this talk on social media. Please keep in touch with us as need be. We thank you very much for your, your attention. We thank you very much for your trust in us and being able to help be uh, part of the fabric of support here in the community. It gives us great honor to step up to the challenge uh, whenever we are faced with challenges along with other organizations in the community uh, who are here to support us. We are not alone. We are stronger together. And uh, this is very much real. As they say, we are not okay, but we are strong. And I'm Yisrael Chai. Thank everybody tonight for being with us. Have a good evening.